like to welcome everybody to University of Haifa's briefing on the upcoming Israeli elections. My name is Karen Berman. I'm the CEO of the American Society of University of Haifa. And I'm joined today uh, with, by Professor uh, Gabby Wyman, who is a full professor of communications at University of Haifa with expertise in political campaigns, persuasion and influence, and the study of media effects and mass media. Gabby is well versed in Israeli politics and elections and was most recently cited in the Jewish press discussing the Likud privacy leaks. We're also joined by uh, Noah from our pre uh, PR agency, uh, Jay Cubed, who will be helping us uh, moderate the, uh, this discussion. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Noah uh, to start us off. Thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to today's discussion. Thank you very much, Karen, for that lovely introduction. And Professor Wyman, thank you for joining us. Um, as uh, most of you are aware, Israel is heading into its third election in a little over a year. And while we might have some election fatigue, next week uh, is an important date. Um, so Professor Wyman will break everything down for us. Uh, I'd like to begin by asking Professor Wyman if he could explain how Israel got itself into such a political logjam in the first place. Well, I think there are two major reasons for that. The first one, unlike the US, we don't have a bipartisan system. Actually, when we have elections, we have at least a dozen of parties running. Sometimes we even had over 20, even, even 26 parties, which means that no single party can actually win the elections and you need coalitions. And if you need a coalition, you need at least 61 out of 120. Uh, and that's not easy to get especially since you've got so many parties with so many diverse interests. Uh, adding to, add to that is that Israel, as you may know, is a, well, I would say quite divided society. The problem is that there are so many divisions that parallel the political division. We have the Jews and Arabs, religious, non-religious, um, immigrants and new immigrants and all the Israelis. Um, we have youngs and olds, we have Ashkenazi and Sfaradi. All those divisions find a way into the political system. So sometimes it's very hard to bridge the gap between the parties because they are not just political identities or political actors, they are also religious, uh, I would say ethnic, uh, ideological, and so on. These two components actually explain why it is so hard to form a coalition in the Israeli politics. Thank you. Well, that being said, though, how is this election different from the last two that we just had? First of all, it's the third one, which means <laughs> we already had two of them. The Israelis are quite tired. And more than that, it is very, very hard to move somebody. I mean, we just voted twice this year. How can you change somebody's mind when things just uh, didn't change dramatically in the situation of Israel or the politics of Israel? Well, we do have some changes though. One of them that we have a prime minister who is going to court. Two weeks after the elections, he will be standing in court, declaring that he's not guilty. That never happened in Israeli politics or in Israeli history. Adding to, it, to that is one major factor. This time, it's not the parties fighting, it's the war of the blocks. Right wing block, left or center wing block. In the past, there were always parties uh, fighting. This time is the question which block we get, I would say, closer to 61 because I can't imagine somebody getting 61. Right. Well, but how do you explain this unwavering allegiance to Prime Minister Netanyahu, especially considering he is going through, he's looking at some unexpected and um, unprecedented legal challenges in the next month or so? Well, we have to admit that. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has many advantages. He's a veteran in, polit in politics, in Israeli politics. He served more than any other prime minister in Israeli history. He's a great, great campaigner. I mean, we should teach him in courses on communication and political communication. And more than that, he has a very loyal uh, audience, supporters, uh, that will follow him whatever happens. So that even makes it even harder for the Israeli politics because some of those loyalties have nothing to do with politics, ideology, vision, attitudes, and so on. They are more into the, I would call it political psychology area, political loyalty, which is more like 
the father figure, the leader figure, regardless of what he done. Well, that being said, his main challenger is Benny Gantz, who has a long uh, career in the uh, Israeli IDF. Um, what does he have going for him? Does he stand a chance this third time around? Well, Gantz is a new into the world of politics. I mean, he stepped in a year ago. No political experience, no media experience, and he's challenging, I would say, one of the best campaigners in the world, probably one of the most experienced campaigners in the world. So for Benny Gantz, the starting point is not easy. Adding to that, that he doesn't have a political or campaigning experience, is that the fact that it will be very hard for him to get the block of 61. More than that, in order to get there, he will need the support of the Arab parties. Now, most Israelis will not approve the support of Israeli Arabs, despite the fact that they are 20% of the population. Um, can he get into a, a leading position without accepting any help, even by, I would say, outside support, external support from the Arab party? Very hard. Well, what do you make of his co-leader, Yair Lapid, and who hasn't, who's famously not gone along very well with the ultra-Orthodox parties? Do you think that he's also contributing to this deadlock? Your question just highlights the point that I made earlier about the divisions and the paralleling divisions and politics. Um, once you get religious, non-religious, politics right and left, socialism and capitalism, uh, right-wingers, left-wingers, new immigrants, all of these explain why it is so hard to form a coalition. Now, you mentioned uh, Lapid, I will mention his father too, Tommy Lapid, who was very anti-Orthodox uh, Jews. Um, so you got the son following his father. Now, how can a, the party, Kaholavan, blue and white, form a coalition uh, without the support of the religious parties? They were always part of coalition. And how can you do it when one leading figure, Lapid, is, is against such an alliance. Well, making it tougher, again, another element that will make it almost impossible to see a, a solid, stable coalition forming next week. And of course, some other major figure in this uh, puzzle is uh, Avigdor Lieberman of Israel Beitenu, who famously uh, predicted a few weeks ago that uh, if Netanyahu doesn't get 61 uh, seats, that he will step down from uh, his, as prime minister. Do you, what do you make of that prediction? Do you think it holds any water? Well, Lieberman is a key figure in Israeli politics, despite the fact that he usually gets 10, about eight to 10 seats after the parliament, that is a small party. He's always the one that can be the kingmaker, joining right-wing bloc or left-wing bloc, that's up to him. Now. So far, he insisted on creating a um, left-right wing. That is, he, he called for national unity government. And he failed twice. Will he keep this principle for the third time? Hard to believe. I think he's leaning now more to a practical solution. And he's even declaring that he will not allow for false elections. Now, he can do that. Joining either the right wing bloc or the left wing bloc. But again, for him to join the left wing bloc, with the religious parties there, or the Arab support is impossible. Here's another element in the puzzle. So let's fast forward five, 10 years from now, and hopefully we won't still be trying to form a government by then. Um, how do you think historians are going to look at this crazy, tumultuous time in Israeli politics? Well, I, I, I would use the word crazy too, and even, <laughs> uh, <laughs> even in a more negative way. We must realize that for a year, we don't have a running government in Israel. We don't have a governing government. We don't have a budget. Uh, no decisions are made. Now, can Israel afford another period of time of no government, um, no budget, no decision, no vision, no program? Uh, it's hard to imagine. Now, I really hope uh, that the Israelis will find a way, though I doubt it, out of this uh, situation. We certainly can't afford a false campaign. Regardless of the question of money, and it's a lot, it's a waste of a lot of money. It's also the fact that we have a state which is not governed. Mm -hmm. But just to play devil's advocate, clearly someone is benefiting from this chain of elections. 
Um, if it was really causing ma mass chaos, there would be riots in the streets and this would be solved by now. But the, there's apathy and the politicians themselves don't seem particularly concerned that we're going to a third election. How do you explain this combination of no progress and apathy in the Israeli public and in, with their, their leaders? I certainly agree with you. The Israeli apathy, the Israeli voters are apathetic, and that's certainly a price that we couldn't afford. Um, Israelis usually vote and are political, politically involved. In the recent election, the last one, 69% voted, which is a quite a high number. Uh, we certainly uh, don't want the Israeli public to be alienated from, politic from politics, from elections, and to, be, uh, and, and to show some apathy. We can't afford it. So one of the prices, the later prices, of third and maybe fourth elections will be that the Israelis will be more pessimistic, more, uh, with more apathy, than I say, with less involvement. And again, that's a price a state like Israel can't afford. And what do you make of the Labour Party that in two election cycles ago is actually having a major, had a major chunk of the, uh, of the parliament and now has been dwindled down to, it, correct me if I'm mistaken, five seats? Um, it, it's, it's quite abysmal what's happened to it, and they've changed leadership, I think, three times as well. Um, what, what's their future? What's in their future? First, let's, let's mention the past. The Labour Party established Israel, and the Labour Party uh, uh, had created the land of Israel, the state of Israel, and the first leadership. Um, it was leading the country for uh, several decades. So uh, it is certainly, uh, I would say, uh, astonishing to see the decline of the Labour Party. Now, one of the explanations for that was the, the issue of the emergence of the center. Israelis moved right, and the more right they moved, they left the left. Leaving the left, a party like Kaholavan, center wing party that has some right, some left, some center, is more appealing. Nevertheless, again, the role of the Labour Party should not be over overlooked, because they can be a key element in the coalition if the blue and white Kholavan party wants to establish a coalition. They are the closest ally. Now that means that if, if uh, Gantz is dreaming of a coalition, he will need them. He will bring them in. And that's the, I would say, the natural partner. So maybe, um, at least for the Labour Party, there's some hope in the coming weeks. And what about uh, the Israeli Arab parties. In the last election, there was a lot of controversy about cameras being installed, thanks to a campaign by the Likud. Um, it's unclear if that's going to happen again. Um, how do you think that affected the voter turnout in Israeli Arab populations, and do you think it'll happen again? Well, from the past, we know that any attack on these uh, Israeli Arabs will uh, lead to an increase in the voting, uh, in the participation in the voting. Uh, the more the Arabs are, are criticized, attacked, the more they will show up and, and vote. Uh, a second, second element is that they formed a, a unity government. That is uh, three different factions, th different Arab parties joined together, um, which makes them a quite a powerful uh, party because uh, this union has the potential of about 20%, 20%, 24 members of the parliament. Now, they will not never get there because the, the participation among the Arab voters is not that high. Nevertheless, they will get 30 to 15 seats, which is uh, the third party in Israel. Uh, you can't ignore them. Where is the problem that some of those elements in some of those ingredients in the Arab uh, party are anti-Israel, anti-Zionism, not, um, I would say, not recognizing the state of Israel. There's no way Jewish Zionist party can form a coalition with uh, uh, factions of the Arab parties that are considered Israel as an enemy. Even in desperate times such as these where we're really needing a government? I mean, if Benny Gantz, let's say, is just missing a couple seats, uh, as they say, to, yeah. um, to block every, all the Arab Israeli uh, MKs, um, do you, you don't see any sort of compromise being brokered there? Uh, the only hope I see for any support which can be accepted by Israeli Jewish parties, the Zionist parties, will be the support of some factions 
Only if this union, the Arab Union, will break apart in some elements that are, I would say, uh, less critical of Israel, less anti-Israel, um, will go out, step out, then some kind of coalition can be formed. And there was some mentioning of uh, establishing a, such a, 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 I would say, a joint operation with uh, Jewish Zionist parties where the Arabs will get their own minister for Arab Affairs, which I think uh, would be a nice step forward since we have 20% of the Israeli citizens are Arabs. Maybe it's time to recognize that they are a political factor and give them some, I would say, recognition in the political scene too. Mm -hmm. Now, moving outside of Israel, um, Prime, uh, U.S. President uh, Donald Trump has given Netanyahu many political gifts. Do you see a, a last minute 11th hour wild card from Trump that might help tip the scales in his favor? Well, you never know about President Trump, right? Um, it's really unpredictable, but uh, I think he ran out of cards. He said he gave us so many cards, Jerusalem, Golan Heights, uh, the, uh, the plan, the good plan for the 100 years uh, plan, and, and uh, recognition of the Israeli uh, ruling in the West Bank, in the occupied well, territory. I mean, <laughs> uh, Netanyahu got from him more than he expected. Yeah. Um, basically, all declarations. Uh, let me tell you, next week I have to apply for my, renew my visa in the, for the US. Where do I go? Not to Jerusalem, the embassy in Tel Aviv. Um, so most of those playing cards were empty words and uh, political declarations, but certainly, there's no doubt that Trump would like or would prefer to see Netanyahu there than any other leader. Uh, yes, that makes sense. Um, and you travel a lot, I, I imagine, and, and talk about uh, Israeli politics and cybersecurity. When, during your travels abroad, what, are, what do people tell you when they ask about our broken system? What are the most popular questions that you get? Uh, it's very hard to explain the Israeli system. Uh, we are quite puzzling the world. And as very often I get questions, how did it happen? How does it work? You have a democracy, you have a country challenged by so many um, challenges from political security and so on, economic, ethnic, political problems, and yet you have such an unstable political system. Well, that's, that's one of the most common questions. And it's very hard to explain our political system because um, most countries will like to see us as a strong nation led by a strong leader. Um, we, we are the only democracy in, in, the, in the Middle East. We, we should lead the world, uh, the, the, at least the Middle East. And we certainly our uh, model of politics is not the one that we will aspire to. Indeed, indeed. And uh, there's also another major election coming up, and that's the U.S. election. Um, mm -hmm. Are you seeing any parallels between what we're experiencing here in Israel and going through in the United States? Yeah, certainly. The, and we study that and we write a lot about it. There are a lot of similarities between the campaigns of Trump and Netanyahu. Um, astonishing. I mean, it, it's quite uh, the same type of campaign. Both of them are media persons. Most of them are very experienced with the media. Most of them know how to use social media very effectively. Most of them know how to appeal to audiences. Most of them know how to stage shows that will attract audiences and will perform, I would say, the theater of politics. So we have very, in, in a way, two personalities that are very similar to, to each other. No wonder that they are so good friends with one another. They speak the same language for sure. Um, yeah. And what about social media? How do you explain uh, how social media has changed how we view politics, how we get our information about politics? Uh, if you could talk a little bit about it, that, that would be great. Yeah, let me just say that uh, we, we have been studying uh, Israeli campaigns since the 70s. Those days, the major, I would call it old media, television, radio, press, were the leading media in the campaigns. Um, it is very surprising to see how it changed. The internet, digital platform, and especially social media are right now the dominant, um, the dominant stages, the dominant media. Uh, there are some sports, TV sports and radio sports, political campaigns. Nobody's listening, nobody's watching. I, I guess I'm the only one, since I'm a scholar, that has to listen and watch it. And I'm, I, I bet you there's not too many like me. Uh, 
Nevertheless, on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, every minute there's somebody posting a, uh, an ad, uh, um, advertising propaganda and so on. Um, so the way Trump is tweeting every morning, Netanyahu and even his son are tweeting every hour. And what do you make of uh, the Russian interference in our social media sphere when it comes to elections? That's been an issue with the American elections. Is, is that affected the Israeli elections at all? Uh, we wrote a report uh, in the second election, the, the last one, uh, about um, poisoning the political discourse in Israel. That was the title. And the issue was about the invasion from, uh, I would call it bots, um, online proxies sure. that may interfere in the Israeli political discourse. There were, we documented many attempts. By the way, most of them didn't come from Russia, but from Iran. Uh, Iranian agents tried to intrude into the Israeli social media. Uh, interestingly, what we found is that they were not interest, uh, interested or motivated to support one side, but actually the idea was spread chaos, disagreement, um, anarchy, distrust, rumors, fake news, attack the system, not one party, do not support one party, but try to, I would say, get the system out of balance. And before I head into my final question, I do want to thank the audience for sending in a few questions toward the very end. Thank you so much for your participation. Um, last question. What are the chances that we're looking to a fourth election? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I hate to give you the statistically speaking or mathematically speaking, very good chances. Is it good? No. Uh, can it be avoided? I doubt it. The only question is, how many Israelis will go out and vote? How many Israelis will uh, give the vote to a major party in a way that will be able to form a coalition, a stable coalition? Uh, I wish I could say this is the last one, but I can't. Oi, well, on that uh, depressing note, <laughs> I want to thank Professor Wyman for being so informative and shedding some light on this complicated issue. I'd like to toss it back to Karen to wrap up and tease a post-election briefing that we'll be having next week. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wyman. Thank you, Noah. And thank you uh, to everyone who was able to listen and, and dial in on today's call. We will be posting a recording of this call, too, in the next couple of days and sending around the link to everyone. As Noah mentioned, we are also hosting a post-election briefing, hopefully uh, the last post-election, at least in the next year or two for Israel. That will be on March 3rd, the day after the elections at 1230 Eastern, and we will be sending around some information with uh, dial-in instructions as well. And, you know, we wish everyone luck in the coming elections in Israel, and we look forward to being in touch with all of you again uh, to discuss the next round of events. And thank you again very much. Mm -hmm.